Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today, I'm going to take you on a tour of something you've likely never seen before, the Windows source code. Now, I've got it with permission from Microsoft in order to show it to you, specifically the code to Windows Task Manager, which I wrote some 28 years ago. This will be the XP version we're looking at, which would be about 2003, and so that would be about 20 years ago. Still, it'll give you a good introduction to how a Windows application can be built from scratch, and how Task Manager itself works internally. Well, the natural place to start is with the code itself as I received it from Microsoft. Let's take a look in the folder. Task Manager itself is just a flat folder. There are no subdirectories, there are no frameworks, there are no uh, included fancy libraries other than the Windows 32 SDK itself. And so it's actually a very good example of a straightforward Windows program that's fairly easy to understand. Inside the code folder, we see half a dozen uh, header files, about 10 C++ files, the sources file, which is if you're using build.exe from the DDK, which is basically what we used internally to build the NT system with at the time, this is what defines which files are part of this folder and part of this project and binary and so on. It's like a make file. Next, we see a few bitmaps like the red, and which would be the kernel, and the green, which would be the user space. That's the CPU graph, and here it is unlit. So between those three bitmaps, you can draw any height in any combination of user and kernel space. A couple icons. And then at the very bottom here, you'll see something that has not yet changed till 2023, and that is the set of icons that represent your CPU meter when it's in the tray down by the clock. I drew these back in 1995, and they are still there today. All right, let's start with main.cpp. Seems like a natural place to start. It was brought in-house on November 10th, 95, and I think I started it maybe six weeks before that, so that'll roughly date it. Now, we're going to go down to module entry because that is actually where the execution will begin once this application is loaded. This is my module entry call, and you'll see the very first thing it does is call security init cookie. What is that? Well, what it does is every time a function call is called at the entry point, it places a stack canary on the stack, which is a known value or pattern that it places on the stack, and then everything that happens after that in the function happens down the stack from there. Now, if there was a buffer overrun or some kind of stack overflow, as soon as the function goes to exit, it will check and find that the magic cookie value that it's placed on the stack is either missing or damaged, and it will just immediately commit seppuku and end the process. This way, you can't do a buffer overflow exploit and then have something continuing after that, and it does help to keep the program more secure. After it calls security net cookie, it calls the real module entry. And here's something that I put in a long time ago that they've taken out that I kind of miss. Initially, when Task Manager was first created and going on for XP, and I don't know how many versions after that, the very first thing it does is to set itself to high priority class. That way, if you press Control shift escape and the win logon process starts a Task Manager for you, and your system is bogged down with a whole bunch of things or something burning 100% of the CPU, it will have enough priority to come up and give you the ability to take control and kill that. The way they've got it now, they've got it at regular priority class, I believe, and that has the side effect of if your system is really bogged down and all the cores are busy and you try to bring up a task manager, it can fight with the rest of the processes and doesn't come up that quick all the time. I imagine having it sitting around in the background at high priority may have been fractionally hard on some benchmarks or made a material impact in some way to performance. Now, the next thing this program does is call init term. And the reason it does that is because it does not link in the compiler runtimes for the C++ language. Those are a little heavyweight for something that's trying to stay small. And Task Manager, I think, winds up being something like 85K when it's all fully compiled. Init term walks an import table of objects that need to be constructed. So if you have C++ objects at global scope, init term is what's actually going to call their constructors for you. So if you don't do it and you don't link in the runtimes to do it for you, nobody will call your constructors. Next, we can see that it gets the command line and parses out quotes and so on. Nothing terribly interesting. It then calls win main. And the reason it calls win main is so that it's orthogonal with all other Windows programs that have a win main. They also have a module entry, but that module entry is usually in the compiler runtime, which calls your win main for you. Since we had our own module entry, it calls win main for us just like that. All right, win main, Windows app startup does basic initialization and creates the main window. 
So you're given a handle to your instance, which is basically your process, a previous instance, which is a Win31ism of having multiple instances of the same memory space, I think. That's a long time ago, and I don't remember pre-instance very well. Command line is a command line that we just parsed out, and show command is how you want the window showing. Now, Task Manager has a bit of an interesting problem in that it needs to be single instance because you really only want one Task Manager floating around, not three of them. But you need it to be able to handle the case where one crashes or hangs. And so what it does is when it starts up, it sends a special message to any existing Task Manager saying, hey, can you wake up and take over? The guy asks for a Task Manager or the girl asks for a Task Manager. And at that point, it will either wake up and do its right thing and respond back with a confirmation message, or it will fail to do so, and Task Manager will go on to start another instance for you. Now, it does protect some of this with a mutex, so it avoids a race condition here, potentially, and that's what this code is doing. It creates a mutex, waits till it gets the mutex, then we'll go through and do a find window on the dialog with the title Task Manager, it will then allow that window to come to the foreground. This is a bit tricky because you'll notice that Windows does some pretty fancy focus management and it prevents apps from just popping up to the top of the stack when you're working in, say, Word. You don't want another window popping up on top of you. Uh, unless maybe you've pressed Control Shift Escape and you're trying to get Task Manager. So there's a special call here, allow set foreground window, that will allow you to do that. Once it's allowed that other existing task manager to surface itself, it then sends the private activation message, which says, hey, go turn yourself on, show yourself, and let me know that it all worked out. If it responds with PWM activate, which means that, yep, I was able to do it and I'm running healthily, then it just exits out of here. So it's going to go to cleanup. Otherwise, it's going to continue starting up. And so this could give you two task managers if the other one is zombied or not responding or something else is going on, but that's better than no task managers. So that's the compromise it makes. The next thing it does very early in the startup is check the registry to see if the system administrator has disabled task manager and then it will refuse to run. So you've probably seen this in a library computer somewhere else where you tried to bring up task manager and it said task manager has been disabled by the system administrator. Well, that's this policy and that's how it's done. Now, to use the Windows Common Controls, you have to call init Common Controls. So that's the next thing we do. And then we call init Dave's Controls. Let's go check that out. There are a couple standard Windows controls that did not have the behavior that I specifically wanted in order to be able to avoid all flicker. One example was the group box, which has a tendency of erasing itself every time it paints, and therefore any content within the group box can flicker while you're resizing. To avoid that, I did a superclass on the group box to make my own version of the group box called... Ah, Dave's frame class is the actual name of the class. And so to superclass it, we give it its own Windows procedure, which will handle certain messages like erase background differently. If we go look at Dave's frame winproc, here we can see that when the window is created, it overrides that message to do the default behavior, but it's also going to do some extra work, which is to turn on the clip sibling style for these uh, group boxes. And the reason it does that is if you have two next to each other and you're dragging them sizing, you don't want them to clip each other as or overpaint each other as they actually render. If the message is erased background, we're going to effectively eat it by calling def window proc. For every other message other than create and erase background, we just pass it along by calling call window proc on the old window procedure. All right, back in win main, the next thing it does is create a thread called the tray thread message loop. This is going to be the thread that's going to communicate with the shell and the explorer in order to show things down by the clock in the tray menu. Now, it does it on its own thread, not just to be uh, efficient, because it's not, but it's doing it on its own thread so that if that thread hangs when talking to the shell, because the shell hangs for some reason, the task manager doesn't hang. You'll lose your tray icon, it'll be jammed up, but task manager itself will continue running. And here we find the most important variable in all of Task Manager, and that is the array of pages. So that's going to be your process page, your task page, your performance page, and so on. So at its core, the Task Manager app is just a top-level frame window, then a set of tabs for selecting which page you want to show, and then five pages, in this case for XP, of which one is visible at any one time. And then there's OK and Cancel buttons. Pardon the camera shake. This is a gimbal camera that I'm just testing out to see if I want to review it, and I'm not entirely sure at this point, but we'll see how it goes. Oh, there we go, shaking again. If I blink my eyes, I think the camera shakes. Maybe we'll take off the tracking mode now. There we go. I will now be fixed in space. So there's an array of five page objects, and a page object is an object that does the basic things that all of the pages need to be able to do. Let's go have a look at that class, such as task page, which will... 
in turn derived from the base page. Let's see what a page is capable of and responsible for. It must be able to initialize, activate when it's being displayed, deactivate when it's being hidden, destroy when it's being torn down, provide a title, get the window handle to the actual page, and then a timer event that just feeds updates and stuff to the various pages so they can each take an update. And that's it. There's no other commonality between the pages. There's no shared hierarchy. There's no complicated class structure. It's just that's what a page needs to be able to do, so that's all it's defined to do. These are all pure, which is a definition we use that amounts to equal zero, so it means they're abstract virtual pure functions. Well, not abstract, sorry. So Task Manager has a nicety here where to uh, make sure that it still works when you're in a low memory situation, which I forget what it, let's go find out. Let's go find out if memory is low. That is if memory is in memory required, which is what? Eight megabytes. So if you have less than eight megabytes, it's not even gonna to try to create the performance and networking and user pages and so on. It's just gonna give you the task and process pages so that you can manage the processes that are currently running on the system and hopefully kill whatever's eating all your memory. But in the normal case where you have at least eight megabytes of memory or more free, you get the task page, then you get the process page, you get the performance page, a network page, and then if you have terminal servers so you can have multiple users logged into the system, you get a users page as well. And at the beginning here, it does a load global resources, which is going to go and initialize all of the resources that the program is going to need to run. So let's go see what that does. It's going to load the accelerator table. It's going to load all the images for the tray icons. It's going to load all of these strings. And we'll go take a look at these because it's a little interesting. So there is a set of globally accessible strings because these all have to be translated. And rather than having to do a load from resource and so on each time that you touch the string, we want to just keep a cached version of the string because we're using them so often. So if we're drawing, basically if you're busy drawing the list view and you're drawing the uh, priority column, let's say, and you have 15 normal processes, rather than calling load string 15 times, this does it once at the beginning of the program. And that's a good opportunity to make a point here. This is code I wrote almost 30 years ago and I have learned a few things since then, I would hope. So there are certainly things I would do different. This program follows the Charles Pett's old model of having a global window proc and having most of your variables that are not class related to other functionality stuck at global scope. If I were to do it today, I would probably define an application class and make all of these global strings, member variables, and that kind of thing. This made sense in the context of the time, and I didn't want to create my own frame app work or anything like that, but I think now I would aggregate all these things into one class. I would certainly use smart pointers, which would avoid the use of go to, which is, we'll see examples of that where Let's say there are eight resources that you want. It could be memory, they could be handles, they could be whatever, but you get them in order. Now, if you don't have auto handles or auto pointers or some way to automatically free them as they go backwards out of scope, then any failure along the way, you have to unwind just the ones that you've allocated so far. That gives you really two options of style. It gives you the ability to nest it deeply and then have the else ifs unwind, or you can just do a go-to cleanup and check which handles have been set so far. It's a lot cleaner, even though, I mean, you've been taught for <laughs> probably since day one, avoid go to, but we'll see there are cases. And this is one of those cases, probably the only case I can think of. And that's it. After it's loaded the strings and the images, that's all it needs to do. Yeah. So if you change the, and I don't know if windows even supports that, does it? Can you change the language on the fly or do you have to actually install a different language pack and reboot? Because that's okay. But Task Manager won't notice if you change the language partway through a run, and it's not going to relocalize all of its cached strings. Okay, we're back in WinMain now, and we've just called load global resources. Now we're going to initialize the history buffers. Let's go see what that's about. So it's going to get a bunch of performance and processor info, and it needs buffers for that because it's going to call this repeatedly. And there's a bit of a trick with this in which you start with the smallest buffer you can and then you pass it to the system tell it here's my buffer and then it will tell you is that big enough yes or no and if it is fine but if not you've got to keep reallocating until you get a large enough buffer because you don't know in advance what the system is going to want so the first thing we do is we get the basic info from the system which will tell us the page size which i believe is always 4k but i'm not certain and the number of processors which in my day was one or two and in really rare cases uh four we had an alpha with four, I believe, or maybe it was a MIPS. There was one four processor machine. It wasn't my machine. I had a dual processor MIPS R4000, I believe, at 100 megahertz. 
Now, here's something that's interesting. If you have more than 32 processors, it's going to bail on you at this point. And the reason for that is in these days, uh, everything was done through masks. So if you wanted to set process affinity, you would pass a mask, which was 32 bits wide, one for each processor. Um, it's Now you have the notion of NUMA nodes and so on that can group processors and you can have a larger, but this, this code had no, NUMA nodes hadn't been invented yet. So at this point, if this code sees more than 32 processors, it's just going to bail. Fortunately, I don't know if you can run more than 32 on XP anyway. Pretty sure you cannot. Consider the case in Task Manager where you have a graph and then you size Task Manager wider. What does it backfill the area just revealed now that you're wider in the history graph? Well, it doesn't just leave it blank. It goes back into further history and draws as much history as it has. And it can have 2,000 frames. So I guess that means if you've got a big 4K display and you drag a single processor graph Wider than 2,000, at least with this code, you're only going to get 2,000 frames of history data going back anyway. But in the days of 800 by 600, that was a lot. Now, the next thing we're going to do is ask for all the CPU information. So we give it a buffer that is equal to the max processors times the size of a processor information buffer. We get that information, and then we go through and we look at the total CPU idle time, total time, and kernel time, and we store those away as the previous value. That way each frame we can see the delta in it. And so when we initialize, we take the current snapshot of what that value is. It next calls initialize network info for anything that the network page needs to do. And then it's gonna call create dialog on the main window. It's not a modal dialog, like one that you're forced to interact with with a okay cancel pop-up style. It is a modeless dialog, which means it can be pushed to the back and so on like a normal window. After creating the main window, the first thing it's going to do is check all the system settings for localization, like commas and decimal points and K and gigabyte and where that all goes. Let's have a quick look at that. So it's getting the locale info for time, the thousands, separator, the decimal point, and how strings or number, numbers are grouped, and what the group separator is. And it will do that, I believe, in another case too, which is... If the system color changes or a setting change comes in, every app is given a broadcast message of WM setting change. And on that opportunity, the app goes through and recreates all of its settings. But this case is the main very first time. Once it's done, it gets the original window position from your options, which are saved on exit, or saved probably every change, we'll see that later. And so the task manager comes back up in the exact same place that it went to sleep or that it was terminated or you pressed escape last time. What if it's off screen? Well, we'll find that out in a minute. At this point, if we own the startup mutex, we let it go because we're now into the actual past the point of creating the main window. At this point, we assume like the Highlander, we are the only one. There can be only one. And as the one true task manager, we're going to take the opportunity to set ourselves to be the last thing to exit. And that way, uh, if anything goes wrong while your system is shutting down, your task manager will still be around to the last minute in order to try and help you out. And this is the main window message loop. This is what an app does all day long. It checks to see, do I have a notification message of some kind coming in to tell me that something is happening? No? Well, then wait until there's a message. And every time anything happens, be it a timer tick, be it a mouse move, be it a change in a control or a window or a state or anything, a message is sent to this loop, and this loop will dispatch the message. We'll see where all those messages go in the main Windows window procedure. Back on the subject of go-tos, this is the cleanup label that all those go-tos were going to. What it does, since all these variables start out properly initialized to null or zero, it can check, have I created the startup mutex? And if so, then I'm going to release it and close it. And if I have the task page, I'm going to delete it. If I have the process page, I'm going to delete it, and so on. So only the things that have been initialized and created get unwound here, no matter at which point you did the go-to. And so if you did it very early in the function, it's the same cleanup code. Your options, again, are to nest it deeply and unwind it or try to handle it in some logical fashion. And I think this is just cleaner. So that's what I did then. Nowadays, I use auto pointers or smart pointers. And as a little side journey, since it's the next thing in the file, here is that init term function that given the two pointers, which is the first constructor and the last constructor to call, it walks that table. And if that entry is non-null, it winds up calling through that function pointer, which is your constructor. 
Okay, let's have a look at the Task Manager main window window procedure. This is where every message that's sent to Task Manager's main window gets processed. Now, you remember a minute ago that we were saving the user's windows position, and we don't want to do that until the user is actually doing it themselves. So we don't save the default positions and any window messages that come through before we've applied the user's preference. The first message of interest is WM Paint. Let's go see how WM Paint is handled. The first thing this code does is check to see whether the window is currently minimized, which is iconic, meaning it's been shrunk down to the tray and there's no main window visible. If it's in that state, it just forwards WM Paint onto def window proc and lets it do its default of probably nothing. If it isn't iconic, meaning it is fully visible at this point, we do a begin paint, then a draw, and then an end paint. So let's go look at the paint. And the only thing that Task Manager draws is a little beveled edge at the top that I thought added a nice little drop shadow underneath the menu. And other than that, there's nothing because everything is just controls. The page is a control. The tab control is a control. The OK and cancel or whatever buttons are on the bottom are controls. And so they are just handled through their own normal default painting and there's no custom painting to do. But what about like the performance graphs and so on? Well, those are handled by the individual pages. So we'll see the painting of the performance graph when we take a look at the performance page. But the net of it is that the main app, the main window itself does almost no painting. There's a print client message in Windows and its purpose is to be able to allow you to render to a different DC, which it uses a DC being a device context. Uh, so that it can use to render print jobs. So if you want to print your window, you draw yourself to the printer device context. And so it's just going to call draw, basically, but it's going to do it into the uh, provided HDC. And it's going to just call main win draw, just like we did for the main painting. Some of this I'll kind of glance over, like min max info for limiting or maximizing or forcing the size of the window, um, tray icon handling stuff, what to do when you're activated. Well, that actually probably is interesting. Let's go take a look at that. Show running instance. So this is someone externally, like another task manager has started up and has asked us to start up and be the activated task manager so it can go away. And now we have to reply properly to it, otherwise it's going to start up and continue as we saw in the startup code. Open icon is sort of an antiquated way of describing the process of clicking on a taskbar icon to bring the window back up, if it's iconic. Uh, foreground window, bring it to the front, and then set our window pos to hmost top if we are set to always on top. Then we set the topmost, otherwise we just set it to top. And we're not going to move or resize or change anything else. We're just changing our Z order at this point. Now, there's one tricky thing about Windows Dialogs, and that is you don't get a chance to return a result for your message. Your return value tells Windows whether you handle the message or not, not what the value of the return is. So the correct way to return a value from a Dialogs window procedure is to set the window long for message result, which will tell it to say then now this is the value he wants to return, so I'll return that for him. It's a little roundabout, but it's kind of because return was overloaded to mean whether you process it or not what the return value should be. So to return PWM activate, confirming that we have now started up and become again the main task manager, we return that message to the caller. Here it looks like I had a feature so that when you had Task Manager in its little widget mode, which is with no borders or anything, just the graphs, um, that you could right click on it and that would cause it to hide so you could see what was underneath it. Apparently that was the, properly decided as being a little too obscure of functionality and so it's inside a if def enable hiding, which is not defined. So this feature is not currently turned on. NC hit test is an interesting message in Windows. It's what Windows sends to you to say what type of area in your window is the user clicking on? Is it client? Is it title bar? Is it border? Is it right edge, top edge, bottom edge, left edge? All the things the user could be clicking on so it knows what kind of mouse cursor to show and what kind of behavior to support. So with Task Manager, when it's in that weird widget state, you can just click anywhere in the non-client area and drag it around because there's no title bar to drag. And so when the system asks us, what is the user currently clicking on? We have to look. If we're currently in the no title mode and they thinks we're clicking in the client area and we're not iconic, then we're just going to say, no, you clicked on the caption, not the title or not the client area. So we're going to lie and say any clicks and drags on the client area are the same as those on a title bar. And this is what allows you to just grab the window from anywhere and move it around. A double click message is what tells the window to go into that weird widget state and or the no title state as it's called in the code. And so we're basically toggling that state here. Yeah, iTab is the new selection in the tab control. And so we try to activate the new selected tab. And if that fails, and we have 
a non-negative current page, meaning we have a valid current page, I think this should be MI current page. So what I would do in the old days was say, bug bug. No, MI current page. There we go. And then I would fix it, but I can't fix it now. It's kind of late. Now, the main window sizing is some of the more complicated code in the project, so it's time to look at that. This code is called every time that the window is being sized, and it checks to see if I minimized, then I'm going to hide the main window. So that means when the tray is gone, I'm going to actually hide the main window as opposed to just keeping it minimized. Now we're going to go in and rearrange and resize a bunch of stuff, but we want to avoid Flickr at all costs because it's my pet peeve. So we're going to use begin defer window pause, which means don't do anything yet, but build up a list of all the things I'm going to do in the system and then do them all at once as a sort of an atomic operation. It's not really atomic, but it happens all at once instead of once every time you're going through your loop or as you do each window handle. Now the status bar takes up a little room on the screen as well, so it accounts for that, and then it positions the tab control based on what remaining screen real estate there actually is. Now some of these flags optimize the way in which you change a window position. For example, we know we're not moving it, it's always going to be anchored at 0, 0. We know we're not changing the Z order at this point, and we're not activating any windows, so we can tell the system that, and it will avoid and skip a certain amount of work, which will make things faster. And that's the bulk of the window message handling for the main task manager window. Now, I thought I was going to get a lot further than this today. Unfortunately, I think I'm going to have to break this here based on my edit sort of clock running in my head. I think we're probably getting close to an hour, perhaps. So I'm not sure yet. It depends on much I prune. But I'm going to see if there's enough interest in this. Then I'll come back and I'll run through the rest of the code. We've got to look at how the process page works, how the performance page works, how the graphs are drawn, how it gets all the performance information about the CPUs and processes. So we kind of have to work our way there or it won't make any sense, but we've looked at the outer structure now of the main window. If you're enjoying any of this process, please subscribe to the channel so you see the subsequent episodes. And if you're already subscribed, make sure you haven't been unsubscribed by mistake and turn on the all notifications icon while you're at it. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, hope to see you next time.